Well, this morning, uh, we are going to be in the book of Mark, uh, Mark chapter 12, verses 28 through 34. We're continuing on here in our uh, series in Mark that we're calling A Son to Serve. A Son to Serve. So, um, Mark 12, uh, 28 through 34, I'll read it, and you can follow along in your Bible or on your phone, or you can look at the words on the screen behind me. Mark 12, 28 through 34. And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that he answered them well, asked him, which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus answered, the most important is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said to him, You are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one, and there is no other besides him. And to love him with all the heart, and with all the understanding, and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself, is much more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to ask him, any more questions? Let's pray and ask for God's help this morning. Heavenly Father, we ask for humility as we come to your word. Help us to submit to the truth about ourselves and to rejoice in the truth about who you are and what you have done for us in Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, on February 9th, 1964, something happened that changed the world forever. And that night, the Beatles performed on the Ed Sullivan Show. And it's reported that 73 million people turned, tuned in to watch the four lads from Liverpool. Uh, maybe some of you were part of those 73 million people. As you, as you probably can tell, I was not. Um, I think my dad was two years old when that happened. Um, so that tells you how old Mike Durbin is, in case you were wondering. Um, <laughs> but uh, 73 million people tuned in, and that night, Beatlemania officially began in America. And when people talk about the Beatles, a lot of times that iconic picture of them on the Ed Sullivan Show is one of the first things people go to. It's one of the first things they talk about. They became so big and so famous that it almost seems like they were just always that way. It seems like they were famous from the moment that John Lennon first picked up a guitar. But what's not often talked about when we talk about the Beatles is the period from 1960 to 1962 when uh, the Beatles spent two years performing at nightclubs uh, in Hamburg, Germany. In Hamburg, the Beatles, uh, they would play shows every single day, and they would play five sets every night for eight hours. So they spent two years uh, playing shows on stages for eight hours every single day. And on one particular stage, they, they performed and they played and they jumped around for so long that they actually broke the stage just from playing on it for so long. And by playing for so long and so much that they were able to hone and, and master their sound, which led to unprecedented uh, success. And so Beatlemania didn't happen overnight. It was the result of uh, years of tireless and unreserved devotion. And here in Mark 12, 28, we have a scribe who approaches Jesus. He hears uh, Jesus' uh, conversation with the, Pharise with the Sadducees about the resurrection. And seeing that Jesus answered him well, he comes and he, he poses to Jesus a question about devotion. Now, as a scribe, he was a religious scholar, which meant that he spent years uh, studying and poring over God's word, poring over uh, the laws of Judaism. And actually, there are around 613 individual statutes of the Jewish law, this scribe would have been responsible for, for reading and understanding and remembering. And so it makes sense that he comes to Jesus and asks him the question, which commandment is the most important of all? This, this wouldn't have been an uncommon question for Jewish scholars to debate, because since where they were, there were so many commands, there were over 600 commands, they would have conversations about which of these commands, which of these laws held the most weight. Which were the most important to obey? Which ones superseded or, or summarized or contained the others? And really, when you get down to it, this was a question of devotion. Because this scribe, he wanted to know Jesus' opinion on which of all these laws was the most 
worthy of his total and complete devotion? Which ones could he focus in on? And which ones could he kind of slack off a bit or kind of ignore a little bit? It was a question of devotion. This question of devotion is important because all of us are devoted to something. All of us have something that we are committing ourselves ultimately to. All of us have something that we are willing to break the stage for. And for some, that's family. For some, that's work. Uh, for others, it might be sports or, or education or religious practice or personal fulfillment or a mixture of those things. And maybe for some of us, the things we're devoted to um, are things we shouldn't be devoted to, things that we do when, when no one else is looking, things that we do that we think no one else will ever find out about, that we kind of fell into and we don't know how to get out of. And so the question this morning is, are we devoted to the right things? Are we giving ourselves ultimately to the things that carry the most weight? What is the most important commandment? What, to what should we give our ultimate love and devotion? And Jesus answers this question by telling us what we should be devoted to, and by telling us what that devotion should look like. And he does so by, by responding to the scribe with two commandments. And these two commandments will form the basis of our outline this morning. We'll look at the first commandment, which Jesus says is the most important, which is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then we'll look at the second commandment, which Jesus says is to love your neighbor as yourself. And as we look at these two commandments, we'll see that Christ calls us to love God and neighbor with unreserved devotion. Christ calls us to love God and neighbor with unreserved devotion. And after he gives this answer, the, the scribe hears Jesus' answer, and he immediately believes that it's right. He sees that it's correct, and Jesus declares that this scribe is not far from the kingdom of God. And my hope this morning is that uh, we too will see the wisdom and the truth in Christ's words, and that our hearts and our lives will be changed as a result. So let's look at the first commandment in verses 29 through 30. First commandment. Jesus, he gets this question from the scribe about what is the most important commandment, and he responds saying, the most important is, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And what Jesus is doing here is he's actually quoting from the Old Testament, from the book of Deuteronomy. He's quoting this, this command from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses four and five. And these verses in Deuteronomy, they're part of a speech that Moses gives to the nation of Israel um, as they're on the edge of finally entering the promised land after wandering in the wilderness for 40 years because they had failed to trust God the first time he led them to the promised land. And so this, in this command, it begins with what is called the Shema, which is, comes from the Hebrew word for hear. And the Shema was, it, was, it became a prayer that devout Jews would would pray every morning and evening. It was a prayer to, to hero Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. They would say this every morning and every evening. But the Shema, it was more than a daily ritual for Jewish meditation. It was actually a vital reminder uh, to the Jewish people of who God is and what he had done for his people. As Israel, as they were preparing to enter the promised land, finally Moses uh, called on them to remember the uniqueness and the faithfulness of God who had called Abraham and promised to make him into a great nation, who had uh, freed them and redeemed them from slavery in Egypt, who had led them across the Red Sea on dry land, who had given them manna from heaven in the wilderness, and who had given them his law at Sinai. As they prepared to enter a land that was full of nations who worshipped many different gods, Moses reminded Israel that they had been purchased and provided for by the one true God, and that he was faithful to his promises to Israel, even when they were disobedient and even when they failed to have faith. And so in response to the love and the faithfulness of God, Moses called Israel to love the Lord their God with all their heart and with all their mind and with all their soul. And he makes it clear that because of who God is and because of what he had done for them, that they belong to God completely. They belong to their one true God, and so they must offer their whole being to him in unreserved love. They must hold nothing back from God, not their hearts or their soul or their strength. As one commentator I read wrote, uh, because the whole man is the object of God's covenant love, 
The whole man is claimed by God for himself. The whole man is claimed by God for himself. And so this is the context here of these verses that Jesus cites from Deuteronomy. And he cites these verses as the first and greatest commandment. And what that means then is that what applied to the nation of Israel as they are about to enter the promised land also applies to followers of Christ today. See, the greatest commandment, it's a call for us to remember that we too are the objects of God's special love and faithfulness. That we too are claimed by our Creator for Himself. And therefore our lives are meant to find their fullest expression and their ultimate rest in unreserved love for God. We are made to find our life in ultimate devotion to Him. To Him. But but the problem is, is that on our own, This kind of love and devotion for God, it's impossible. It's impossible for us to do on our own because just like Israel, we have failed to trust God and obey God and love God as he created us to do. Instead of having our whole beings filled with love and devotion for God, our whole beings are filled with love and devotion for ourselves. Every aspect of our lives, it's it's corrupted by self-love rather than God-love. And Augustine, one of the, the early church fathers, he, he coined a phrase in Latin, and I'm going to pronounce it wrong, I just know it, but he coined a phrase in Latin to describe this, this sinful, this selfish self-love. He referred to it as incurvatus in se, which means to be curved inward back on oneself. He's saying that all of us live our lives in a posture of curved and corrupted self-love rather than a posture of uh, total and complete love for God. All of us are, are curved in and upon ourselves. And if you, want, if you want a modern 21st century picture of this, look no further than the phenomenon of the selfie. Now, I'm not saying selfies are inherently sinful or if you don't eat selfies, that's a sin or anything, but I'm saying here is a picture, think about it, of, of human beings totally and completely curved in on ourselves, looking at a reflection of ourselves, totally consumed uh, with self-focus and focused on our own um, self-love and uh, consumption and expression expression and image. This is the image that, that we get across here from Augustine. This is the image that we get across when we're honest about our sin and our self-centeredness. We are curved inwards on ourselves in, so, in self-love and in sin. And Martin Luther, he expounded on Augustine's idea here of incurvatus in se. He wrote, our nature by the corruption of the first sin being so deeply curved in on itself that it not only bends the best gifts of God towards itself and enjoys them, rather even uses God himself in order to attain these gifts and fails to realize that it so wickedly, curvedly, and viciously seeks all things, even God, for its own sake. See, you and I were so full of self-love that we even curve and corrupt the good gifts of God to the point where God himself becomes not the object of our love, but just a means to get what we really love. He becomes not the object of our ultimate devotion, but just a means to get what we are truly devoted to. And so we engage in worship and service and religious practice, not because we want God, but because we want what God can give us. We obey him, we go to church, we pray, we read our Bibles, we try and be good people because we think if we do those things, then God will have to reward us. He will owe us the the physical security or the material abundance or the relational flourishing that we really want. And so we see that even the good things we do are corrupted by this self-centeredness, by this self-love. They're nothing more than tools in our self-curving project. And so we're too curved in on ourselves. We're too self-centered. We're too full of self-love to obey the greatest commandment, to love God with unreserved devotion. We can't love God with all our hearts and all our soul and all our mind and all our strength because all of those things are too focused and preoccupied with loving ourselves. But we're not without hope. Because just as God was faithful and gracious to Israel when they failed him and when they disobeyed him, so he is gracious and faithful to us even when we have failed to love him as we ought. And he's able to be faithful because there was one who did live a truly uncurved life. There was one who lived a perfect life of unreserved love and devotion to God. 
Jesus Christ was the only person who ever truly loved God with all his heart, with all his soul, with all his mind, and with all his strength. He was the only one who, who perfectly held nothing back. Everything he said and did was done in order to love and glorify his heavenly Father. Jesus is the only one in history who perfectly kept the greatest commandment, who perfectly obeyed the heart of God's law. But then Jesus went to the cross where he was condemned as a law breaker. At the cross, the Son of God, who had perfectly loved the Father with everything that he had, was separated from the object of his love. The one who had perfectly obeyed the commandments of God was rejected as one who had broken the commandments of God. And Jesus willingly took this on. He chose to enter into this suffering for us. Because Jesus gave himself up at the cross to free those who are lost in sin and self-love. Because he had perfectly obeyed the greatest commandment, he was able to be our substitute and bear in his own body the consequences for all of the ways that we have failed to obey the greatest commandment. The one who had perfectly loved God, he bore the cost, he paid the penalty of our self-love. In Christ, on the cross, Jesus paid the price for our incurvatus in se. And here we see the costliness of our self-love. It cost Jesus his life. It cost Jesus everything. And here also we see the grace and the faithfulness of God, who loves us so unreservedly that he did not hold back even his only son from us. And it is only this self-giving love of God in Christ that can free us from our sinful self-love. It's only when we behold this love, this self-giving, costly, unreserved love of God, who did not hold back even his only son from us, that you will actually be able to love God with everything that you have. Your heart will be transformed when you remember the heart of God who was moved with grace and compassion for his enemies. Your soul will be stirred when you remember that Jesus gave up his last breath for you. Your mind will come alive when you see the wisdom and the plan of God who worked through uh, Israel and the law to bring about Jesus, the true Israel, and the fulfillment of the law. And your strength will be moved to action when you rejoice and when you wonder in the God who was moved to action on your behalf, even when you don't deserve it. And all of this will be empowered and enacted by the Holy Spirit who, who seals and transforms those who have put their faith in Christ. And so his unreserved love for us, it breaks the back of our, our curved self-centeredness. And it straightens us out into a new posture. A posture of humbled, grateful, and completely unreserved love for God. We hold nothing back from him because he held nothing back from us. We, we give ourselves, we give everything we have in unreserved devotion to him because he was unreservedly devoted to us. And so his unreserved love for us in Christ transforms us and compels us to offer him our unreserved love and devotion in response. This is the new posture of those who have put their faith in Christ, who have been transformed by his unreserved love. And this posture, it radically changes how we live. It radically changes how we respond to God, how we worship, how we do good, how we read our Bibles, how we pray, and how we treat other people. And we see this specifically in the next commandment that Jesus gives, the second commandment um, here in verses 31 through 34. And so if the first commandment was focused on our vertical relationship with God, then uh, the second commandment that Jesus gives us focused on our, our horizontal relationships uh, with our neighbors, with one another. Jesus says, the second is like it, you, must, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, now there's probably, there's maybe no more well-known saying of Jesus than this one right here. If you spend any time in an elementary school, uh, you'll probably see posters with this command on it um, with cute uh, animals and cartoon characters and classrooms and hallways. Um, we, 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 these words are quoted by Christians and non-Christians all over the place as the golden rule. You know, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. 
right? We, we teach this to our kids as a, as a call to be nice and as a call to be generous and to show respect and to share. And we think of it as a nice thing, as a good thing. We put it on posters, we talk about it, we reference it in conversation. But I think really oftentimes we miss the depth of this. We miss uh, what Jesus is really saying. We miss how profound this statement really is. Because just like with the first commandment, Jesus isn't just coming up with something out of the blue. He's actually, uh, once again, quoting directly from the Old Testament. Here he's quoting from the book of Leviticus, uh, chapter 19, verse 18. So if you, if you have a Bible, you can turn there to Leviticus chapter 19, uh, verses 9 through 18. And in, in these verses, uh, we, we, fat, we go back in time 40 years, you know, from where we were in Deuteronomy, where in Deuteronomy we were at the edge of Israel finally entering the promised land. But here in Leviticus, we're actually uh, right when they first get into the wilderness, right after they've been freed uh, from Egypt and slavery. Um, and in these verses, God is calling his newly freed people to be holy as he is holy. He, he's giving the Israelites specific commands regarding, regarding how to live out his holiness amongst their neighbors when they get to the promised land. Now, I won't, I won't read this whole passage, so you can just look along with me and follow along, and then I'll leave it for you to read the rest of it on your own. But what we see in these verses is that in response to the holiness of God, the Israelites are called to love their neighbors with unreserved devotion. If you look at these verses, you'll see that God calls his people not to reserve food from those in need, but instead to, to leave the, the gleanings of their harvest and the fallen grapes from their vineyards for the poor and for the sojourner and the needy. You know, the Israelites, they're, they're not to hold back the truth from one another, but are instead called to deal with one another honestly and justly. They're not to hold back the wages of a worker or bring hardship upon the weak. They're called to not reserve justice from one another, but um, instead to deal righteously and equally with all, whether they're poor or rich. And they're not to withhold love from their neighbors by bearing a grudge or seeking vengeance. They're called to love their neighbors as themselves. And this call to love, it's more than a command to be nice and respectful. God's people, they're to, call, they're to care and love for their neighbors as they care and love for themselves. And so just as, as you, know, you would never want to reserve practical needs from yourself like food and shelter, or reserve human needs from yourself like justice and mercy, uh, God calls his people to offer these things um, to their neighbors in loving devotion. He tells them to love them as their selves. And repeated over and over again throughout these verses, if you look, you'll see that um, repeated over and over again is the phrase, I am the Lord your God, or I am the Lord. God repeats this phrase in Leviticus after each of these commands as a reminder um, to his people of why they are doing these commands, why they are to obey these words. And like the Shema in, Deut in Deuteronomy, this phrase, I am the Lord your God, it was, it was shorthand. It was a shorthand for reminding the Israelites who God is and what he has done for them. It was a way of reminding themselves of the God, the faithful God, who had chosen them as his own special people and who had rescued them from slavery in Egypt. And so all these commands God gives them in Leviticus 19, they're grounded with a reminder of the salvation that God had already provided for his people. Because the commands of God always come after the salvation of God. The commands of God always follow the salvation of God. It's like if you join a basketball team, then you're given a playbook. You don't have to learn and memorize all the plays in order to make the team. You're only given the playbook once you're on the team. You know, if I'm walking around downtown Cleveland, Tyron Lewis isn't going to pop out from behind a corner and start quizzing me on the Cavs plays. You know, maybe he should because they're not doing great right now. But, like, that won't happen because I'm not on the team. I'm not a professional basketball player. I don't know if you can tell by looking at me. Right? It's only those who are on the team that have to learn the plays. It's only when you make the team that you get the playbook. It's not something you get or you memorize in order to make the team. Knowing the plays is a responsibility that comes once you are on the team. It is not a requirement for making the team. And so in the same way, the Israelites were not God's people because they obeyed his laws. They were given his laws because they were his people. Their status as God's people was not based on their obedience but on God's saving work. Their obedience was the fruit of their salvation. It was not the root of their salvation. And this is true for us as well. Because the call to love our neighbors is not a requirement for our salvation. It's a response to our salvation. 
We love our neighbors as ourselves because in Christ, God has already perfectly loved us first. He loved us first, even when we didn't deserve it. Because just like with the first commandment, we're too lost in sin and self-love. We're too curved in in ourselves and corrupted to be able to actually love our neighbors as ourselves. We can't keep this command either. We don't offer mercy when it is needed. We participate in systems of injustice without even realizing it. We deal falsely with one another and we are quick to bear grudges and to seek vengeance. Over and over again, we fail to love our neighbors as ourselves. We fail to keep this commandment. And if you're not convinced, then look at the world around us. You know, a few weeks ago, we remembered the 50th anniversary of the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. And yet even today, in Philadelphia, two black men can get arrested for waiting for a friend at Starbucks. Isn't that a failure to love our neighbors? Or every day in this country, thousands of babies are aborted. Isn't that a failure to love our neighbors? And in our own community, uh, the number of deaths from opioid overdoses has tripled in the last two years. Isn't that a failure to love our neighbors? We're more divided uh, economically and politically and socially than we've ever been in decades. Isn't that a failure to love our neighbors? We could go on and on and on, but the point is clear. On our own, we are utter failures when it comes to loving our neighbors as ourselves. And nowhere, nowhere was this failure more clear than at the cross. Because in his arrest, in his condemnation, in his crucifixion, Jesus experienced ultimate injustice, ultimate falsehood, and ultimate oppression. Jesus, who had perfectly loved his neighbors, who had healed the sick and raised the dead, he was mocked, he was beaten, and he was killed. There's never been a greater or more tragic failure to love one's neighbor. And yet it was through this act of failure and injustice that Christ ultimately loved his neighbors. Because at the cross, Jesus received no mercy so that God's mercy could be poured out on us. He suffered ultimate injustice so that we could be justified before God. He was oppressed so that we could be set free from the oppression of our sin. He was rejected so that we could be accepted. And he endured slander and falsehood so that we could receive the word of truth. He bore the vengeance and hatred of God so that we could receive his love and his peace. And this perfect neighbor love of Jesus is what transforms us and gives us new power and freedom to love our neighbors as ourselves. Because when you see the mercy offered to you in Christ, it should compel you to offer mercy to those in need. When you rejoice and wonder at the justice of God who punishes our sins at the cross and yet justifies us in Christ, when you see that, it should lead you to seek justice for those who are oppressed. When you see the brokenness of your sin that led to Christ's body being broken for you, it should lead you to want to offer healing the places of brokenness in our world. And when you see the truth that is in Christ, it should lead you to want to offer this truth to everyone you can. Because his love for us is the only thing that can break through our self-centeredness and compel us to truly, unreservedly love our neighbors. His self-giving devotion to us should lead us to offer everything we have and an unreserved devotion to him and to those around us. As John writes in 1 John chapter 4, verse 11, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. If God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. And of course, this, this brings to mind, this reminds us of, of one of the most famous songs to come from the Beatles, right? All you need is love. All you need is love. You remember how the chorus goes, right? I'm not going to sing it, but uh, you remember how the chorus goes, all you need is love. All you need is love. All you need is love, love. Love is all you need. Love is all you need. And in a sense, this is true, because in response to the question about the greatest commandment, Jesus 
uh, says that the greatest commandment is to love God and love our neighbors with unreserved devotion. He calls us to love, and it's only his love that actually empowers and transforms us and frees us to offer this love to other people, to offer this love unreservedly to God. So in a sense, his love is all we need. But the love that that Jesus is talking about here is so much more than the kind of the shallow uh, 1960s, let's all love each other and be happy and drive around in vans and go to concerts kind of love. His love is so much deeper than that. Because the love Jesus calls us to is costly. It costs Jesus his life, and it will cost you your life as well. It demands your ultimate devotion. It will force you to confront and to kill your curved and your corrupted self-love. It will cost you everything you are trying to hold back in reserve. When you remember the unreserved, costly, self-giving love of God, who did not hold back even his only son from us, but instead gave him up for us, you'll realize that the only response that makes any sense is to give everything you have, all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength, in unreserved love to God and to your neighbor. So the question this morning is, are you devoted to the right thing? Has your heart and your life been transformed by the unreserved love of God in Christ? Is he the one you are ultimately devoted to? Is this what you are willing to break the stage for? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're humbled as we remember your love, your merciful love, your costly love, your just love, your gracious love, your unreserved love that gave up everything for us at the cross. Lord, help us to behold this love, to wonder at it, to be transformed by it, and to be compelled and led to to love you unreservedly and to love our neighbors as ourselves. Lord, we live in a world full of brokenness, full of injustice and idolatry and failure and fear. But Lord, in you we have a hope. We have truth. We have life that is greater than anything that is out there. So make us a people who are marked by your love, by love for you and by love for our neighbor. And help us to go out from here rejoicing and wondering in the unreserved love you have for us. And help us to live our lives in unreserved devotion for you and for our neighbors, for your glory, and for the good of all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.